now we can do another offering. This is called a mandala offering. So you're just visualizing all the objects of the universe, all the things that make people happy, all the objects of the senses, piling them all up and imagining offering to all the Buddhas, all the Bodhisattvas and all the, suffer all the, all the holy beings and imagine them delightfully receiving our offering. And the second one, as you'll see from the words, we'll say that in English after. Saji perki jug shing metog tram ri rabling ji ni de gen padi sange jing du mig te or wagi drokonam dag jing la chapa shog. This one's called the inner mandala, and um, it's really just offering all your ridiculous delusions, all the objects of your delusions and your delusions. Give them all away, you know. The Buddha can handle them. Dagi chag dang mong sun ke pe yul dra nyen bar sum lu dang long cha che pang pa me pa bul gi leg jene dog sum rang sa drol wa jin gi lo. Now, as we say the Sanskrit mantra, we imagine they will receive our offerings very happily. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryatayami. <coughs> so now maybe we can do one more little other lam, another variation of a lamb rim a summary thing like we did yesterday, another one, a variation of it. And then we can do a, a meditation. We think, I thought I might lead a meditation, a visualization meditation on the Buddha Tara. Well, then we'll do that. So let's do the one, praise in, depend, in praise to the Buddha for his teachings on dependent arising by Tsongkhapa. It's on my page 100, around about there, 100. Chapter 18. Most of the things, they, these people, they, these, these yogis, when they wrote, especially in Tibet, they, they were kind of great poets as well. So most of what they wrote was poetry. You know, it came from their experiences and they'd write a text and it'd be in poetry, you know. And sometimes they say that these texts, you can read them one way and then you read them backwards, it's another text, and you can read them diagonally, it's another text. So they're quite clever with words. They've got the power of speech, definitely. So just again, think about, just contemplate the meaning, listen to it, or recite it with me as you wish. Apparently, this he wrote this. This is the 14th century, our lineage Lama. Oh, it doesn't say when he wrote it. What a pity. But I think it's after he's been in retreat or something, thinking about all these things and trying to get the real, try, you know, on the meaning of emptiness. And then this clarity about the meaning of dependent arising came to him. So he wrote this praise to the Buddha, his delight in the on these teachings. Seeing and speaking of dependent arising, he who he uh, he. He was wisdom supreme, teacher supreme. I bow to him who knew and taught the all-conquering dependent arising. Of the suffering existing in the world, its root is none other than ignorance. The understanding to kill this root, you said, is none other than dependent arising. How could those of intelligence not see dependent arising as the heart of your doctrine? Where is greater praise of you, therefore, than in praise of dependent arising? Whatever depends on circumstances is empty of nature. What greater teaching is there than this? The foolish, however, seize on it and only tighten chains of extreme views, while for the wise it cuts entangled nets of fabrication. This teaching is not seen in the works of others. The title of teacher, therefore, is yours alone. Given to others, it is but the hollow flattery of a fox being hailed a lion. Greatest of teachers, greatest protector, speaker supreme, guide supreme, I bow to the teacher of dependent arising. Benevolent teacher, you taught to help all living beings. Emptiness is the essence of those teachings. Its highest proof, dependent arising. Those claiming it proves the opposite. Those denying its very existence, how will they grasp your teachings? 
For you, emptiness seen as dependent arising does not render as contradictory emptiness of self-nature and ability to function. To hold the opposite, to the opposite, however, that with emptiness there can be no function and with function no emptiness is to fall into a dangerous trap. In your teachings, therefore, knowledge of dependent arising is highly praised, but it will not be known to views of self or non-existence. Non-dependence, you have said, is like the sky flower. Non-dependence, therefore, does not exist. Anything existent by its own nature contradicts existence by cause and circumstance. Nothing is not dependently arising. Nothing, therefore, is not empty of self-nature. Self-nature, you said, cannot be destroyed. Phenomena, therefore, possessed of nature, would render nirvana impossible. Samsara, likewise, would have no end. You spoke, therefore, with the roar of a lion again and again on this absence of nature, and amid the assemblies of the wise, who dared to challenge you? The absence of self-nature anywhere, this arising because of that, both presentations are true. But what need to say that both came together without contradiction? Moreover, by reason of dependent arising, one will not depend on extreme views. This is the excellent teaching, my protector, that renders you orator supreme. All this by nature is empty, and this arises from that. Such realizations do not hinder, but mutually complement. What is more wonderful, more astonishing than that? Praising you this way is praise indeed. All other praise is lesser. That some hostile to you, held as the slaves of ignorance, are unable to bear the sounds of no self nature comes as no surprise. That others, accepting dependent arising, the crown jewel of your teaching, are unable to tolerate the roar of emptiness does surprise me. If by the very name of dependent arising, gateway supreme to no self-nature, self-nature is asserted, how will they be led to that noble path that pleases you, that incomparable highway well-traveled by exalted beings? Self-nature, real and not dependent, dependent arising, unreal and of dependent nature. How without contradiction could these two ever come together? Consequently, that which dependently arises has forever been empty and void of nature. Things, however, do not appear that way. All this, you have said, is therefore like an illusion. Others may attack your teaching, but they will never be any match. Such claims are validated by dependent arising. How? Because its explanation casts away all possibility of flawed assertion and faulty denial of all phenomena evident or hidden. This very path of dependent arising, the reason for seeing your words as unparalleled, generates conviction in the validity of other teachings. Having seen the truth, you taught it. Those following you will leave all troubles far behind, for they will cut the root of every fault. Those, however, outside your teachings, those they, uh, though they practice long and hard, or are those who beckon back faults, for they are wielded to views of self. Ah, when the wise see the difference, how could they not revere you from the very depths of their hearts? What need to talk of many teachings? The simplest conviction in just a single part brings on the greatest joy. Alas, my mind is ruined by ignorance, for so long have I gone for refuge to this great store of meritorious qualities, yet not a single one do I possess. As yet, however, my life has not slipped beneath the jaws of the Lord of Death, and having a modicum of faith in you, I do consider myself fortunate. Among teachers, the teacher of dependent arising, among knowledge, knowledge of dependent arising. These two, like a mighty conqueror in the world, you know to be supreme where others do not. All that you have taught proceeds from dependent arising, its purpose, the transcending of suffering. Nothing you do, therefore, is not for peace. Ah, your teachings, those whose ears they fall upon will all find peace. 
Who therefore would not hold them dear? Across their breadth, no contradiction. Opponents' arguments all destroyed. Fulfilling the two aims of living beings, my joy in these teachings grows and grows. For this knowledge you gave away over countless eons again and again, your loved ones, your possessions, sometimes your body, other times your life. Seeing such qualities, I am drawn by your mind like a fish on the hook, not hearing your dharma from you in person, such misfortune. By the pain of such sorrow, my mind will never give you up like the mind of a mother for her precious child. As ye and yet as I think on your words, hearing you talk of this and that, teacher with a voice melodic as Brahma, resplendent with features of perfection, encircled by garlands of light, your enlightened form reflects in my mind like the cool light of the moon, medicine for my feverish torment. Those unwise in this wonderful doctrine were confused and entangled like plaited grass. Seeing this, I followed with diligence the great scholars, seeking again and again your thoughts, poring over many works of our and others' tradition, and yet still my mind was torn by doubts. When, with the kindness of my lamas, I saw this unsurpassed vehicle of yours, leaving behind extremes of existence and non-existence, Elucidated by the prophesied Nagarjuna, his lotus grove illuminated by the moonlight of the glorious Chandrakirti's teachings, whose globe of stainless wisdom moved freely through the sky of your words, dispelling the darkness that holds to extremes, outshining the stars of false speakers. It was then that my mind found its peace. Of all Buddha's deeds, his words were the greatest, and they were words of dependent arising. Let the wise therefore remember him this way. Becoming ordained into the way of the Buddha by not being lax in study of his words and by yoga practice of great resolve, this monk devotes himself to that great purveyor of truth. Due to the kindness of my lamas, I have met the teachings of the greatest of teachers. I dedicate this virtue, therefore, for every living being to be nourished by true spiritual friends. I pray that the teachings of he who is solely benevolent remain unscattered by the winds of false views until the end of time, and with faith in the Buddha gained from understanding their essential nature, may they pervade forever. In all my births, even at the cost of my life, may I never falter nor shrink from working for the wonderful doctrine of the mighty Buddha who showed clearly the nature of dependent arising. I pray that I'd pass my days and nights in thinking how I might spread this Dharma, born from the heroic perseverance in the face of countless hardships of this supreme guide. When I pursue these endeavours wholeheartedly and sincerely, may I be supported constantly by Brahma, Indra, Mahakala, the four guardians of the world and all other protectors. So remembering that the word Buddha is actually referring to this <coughs> unmanifest, <coughs> fully developed, infinitely wise, in, infinitely compassionate, infinitely compa uh, powerful consciousness. And the Buddha's finding is that every sentient being has this potential. That's the nature of our mind. So of course, realizing dependent arising emptiness is the final way to do that. This is what the Buddha has found. Nothing to do with the creator, nothing to do with the body, it's the nature of our mind. So then out of this compassion, countless beings since the Buddha and in times past, according to Buddhism, this is not the first time because minds are beginningless, then countless Buddhas having accomplished this, the, then the motivating force has been compassion. To get that wisdom, to see reality, and then the, but the force that motivates it is this immense compassion. When there's no longer a separate sense of I, this sense of utter connectedness with others and seeing clearly the unbelievable suffering of sentient beings. So this immense compassion and this wish to never give up doing whatever's necessary to benefit sentient beings, to help them be free from their own suffering and achieve their own potential of Buddhahood. So because of this, they need to manifest in forms, manifest in bodies. 
And there's two forms, two types of bodies. The body that we can see, the human form. So Shakyamuni himself, this person, and then the way we see our own, you know, the, the human beings, some human beings on the planet now have accomplished Buddhahood. You can't tell by looking. They look like us, but they have achieved this perfection. And then another form is the one, a subtle, a subtle light body that the, that is visible to the great bodhisattvas in their meditation with the subtle mind. So when you look and see in the Vajrayana teachings, and you see all these pictures of all these different Buddhas, all these ladies and gentlemen in different shapes and forms with many legs and many arms and many other bits and pieces. These are just, it's, just, it's basically, it's Buddhist psychology. I mean, it does not look psychology to us, but it's manifestations of different psychological qualities, either ones we want to cultivate, such as compassion, Chen Rezi, the Buddha of compassion, Manjushri, Manju, gentle voice, the, the manifestation of wisdom, each of them holding certain things. Of course, this is Indian. This is Indian. Then it goes to Tibet. It's very ancient. But the meaning is that they're, they're simply a visual manifestations of different qualities that we're trying to cultivate. Then there are others that are, very, that, that are also called manifestations of, of the delusions, of the purified delusions, the delusions we're trying to rid ourselves of. You know, so there's in one Buddha called Vajrayogini, this gorgeous red lady. She's a manifestation of purified attachment. Because in the Vajrayana, Everything is grist for the mill. All the, math, all the delusions can be utilized on the path to enlightenment. It's, very, it's, it's the most sophisticated part of Buddhist psychology, the most advanced. So there are three essential qualities of, a, of an enlightened being. There's this infinite wisdom that sees things as they are and sees the minds of others. And that a typical manifestation of this is Manjushri, Manju, gentle voice. He's holding a sword and his aloft in his right hand with a tip of fire. So this is representing cutting through ignorance. And his mantra, Omarapatsana Di, is a, is a sound manifestation of that energy. Then you have compassion, for example, the other wing of the bird. Compassion, Chen Rezig in Tibetan. He's the manifestation of kindness and compassion. A sweet, peaceful aspect. And then there's a third quality. You've got the compassion to want to help others, the wisdom to know how, but you need the third one, this crucial one, this power, this capacity to do it. They talk about power, action energy. And this is often represented by the Buddha Tara. She's green light energy, green light, action energy, success, cutting through the obstacles, making things happen. She represents that. So we all need that badly in our lives. We all need to be, you know, to, to cut through our hopelessness and laziness and misery. We all have to have action energy to get things done, to cut through the obstacles, to be successful, to be courageous, brave attitude. That's Tara. So we'll just do a little, again, a variation of this purification, you know, of body, speech and mind. So just if you're not familiar with it, just relax, you know, hear the words, do what you can. So we imagine in front of us the embodiment of enlightened energy in this form, this particular form, this female form. And in, in this Indian style, you see in all the pictures and the statues, they're, they're not the form of the Buddha. The form of the Buddha that we see as the monk is the representation of subdued body, speech and mind, which is the first stages of practice. Then this, this level of practice from the Vajrayana, from the more advanced level, it's the Bodhisattva aspect, and they're totally gorgeous. And these manifestations and these meditations are a different function. They're kind of to enhance our energy, and we utilize our energy. <clears throat> so she's, you know, these different manifestations, they're looking totally gorgeous. They're all, you know, she's, um, imagine she's just sitting there on a, on a multicolored lotus at about eye level. Made, everything's made of light. And everything in, the man of, everything in the visualization has a meaning, has a function, you know. So she's, um, she's sitting, her left leg drawn in like ours in meditation, but her right leg is out, re sort of s relaxing, and it's resting on another little multicolored lotus. And this is showing her action energy. She's ready to hop up to be a benefit, to get things done, <laughs> to help sentient beings. She's, um, like in a lot of these pictures and statues you see, she's kind of half naked. The top part of her body, she's got these gorgeous breasts. Everything's beautiful, utterly beautiful. They say that all the Buddhas in this aspect are in the prime of their youth, totally gorgeous looking, about 16 years old. That's how they say. In the lower part of her legs, you see in the pictures, it's got like multicolored rainbow sort of silken kind of clothes, you know, you'll see it in the pictures. And uh, her face is totally gorgeous, utterly beautiful. Very, her eyes, unlike some of the, the Buddhas, her eyes are 
like for example Buddha Shakyamuni his eyes are half closed half open like in a peaceful aspect half meditation half you know a, 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 never mind that her eyes are sometimes slightly wide open showing her action energy slightly powerful you know she's um, got her hair partially held up in a top knot like you see in all the pictures this five-pointed crown on her head like a tiara and you can imagine the rest of her hair down her back everything's crystal clear radiant radiant crystal clear her right hand she's got jewels you know like you see it in all the pictures like in her ears her uh, throat her head her um, wrists her ankles everything's radiant beautiful and her right hand is on her right knee and her hand is pointing on her right knee and the palm is up and it's in the mudra or gesture of giving like giving things you know and she's holding in the, between her thumb and her ring finger the stem of a blue upala flower that blooms at her right ear and then her left hand is at her heart her fingers pointing up in the gesture I always forget enlightenment or something three jewels maybe I can't remember and it's holding the stem of a blue pile of flower again and that blooms at her left ear so let's kind of imagine her there but what she she's she's it's got all the qualities of an enlightened being but this particular aspect this aspect of power action getting things done and think of it as like a mirror image. If we buy into that meaning, then you're visualizing that and you're, and you're just like, you're, this is what you want to become. So by doing these kinds of meditations, we're um, imagining, it's a method for becoming this ourselves, by identifying with this. If we do have a spiritual teacher, we've committed to somebody we call our Lama or our Guru, our spiritual teacher, well then we think of them manifesting as Tara in front of us for our benefit. That makes it personal showing us what we can become a mirror image of our own potential so now you imagine she very happily sends from her brow radiant beams of white laser light and these beams penetrate our brow and enter into us and fill us completely and what it does first imagine <clears throat> is purify all the, the hopelessness of this body of ours, the sickness, the inability to do what we want, the tiredness, the heaviness of this body, as well as all the sickness of this body, totally eradicating all that, this white light filling us. And the white light continues to come. And this time we imagine what it does is purify all the seeds, all the imprints in our mind from all the actions that we've ever done in all our lifetimes with our bodies to harm sentient beings. So if we've had countless lifetimes and countless bodies, and especially as animals, they might be the most suffering of beings, but they cr the most, the most, the, create the most suffering, harm, the most harm. But as humans and animals, think of the countless lifetimes, killing, eating, destroying, harming so many sentient beings with our bodies. So think of all these imprints, all these seeds, completely eradicated by this radiant white light filling us. How amazing. Not one atom left. Imagine that. All gone. Purified. All the harm. Since now, back to beginningless time. <coughs> Again, Lama Tara sends <clears throat> these beams of white light, radiant white light that penetrate our brow, filling us completely, and this time filling us with our potential. When all the delusion, all we've when we're completely purified, all we can do with our bodies is benefit others. <clears throat> this is our natural potential. Imagine that, full of this blissful light and the potential to only be a benefit to any sentient being, not possible to harm. Thinking in this life, this body, even just today, whoever sees us, tastes us, touches us, smells us, talks to us. They can only be benefited by our body. Can we imagine this? The purpose of our body, thinking, is to benefit others. And then thinking, of course, the potential of a Buddha 
who can completely use the, the energy of the universe to manifest in countless bodies throughout space to benefit sentient beings. Full of this marvelous potential, full of this blissful white light. And now Lama Tara very compassionately sends now from her throat radiant laser beams of red light that penetrate our throat and fill us completely. And this time instantly purify all the nonsense of our speech. You know, this is especially as humans, all the harm we've ever done since beginning this time with our speech. Lying, all the speculating, all the confusing speech, the harsh speech, all the nonsense speaking bad things about people behind their backs, creating incredible disharmony, and all the rubbish speech just pouring out our mouths, you know all the harm we've done with our speech since beginning this time to all sentient beings. And also all our feeling of inability to express ourselves properly, not knowing how to say what we really mean, this inability, this kind of not to use our speech well, totally purified, completely eradicated by this radiant red light filling us. Again, Lama Tara sends these red beams, radiant laser beams from her throat, enter our throat, this time filling us with our potential. To utilize this sound, to utilize this ability, to you know, the, these elaborate concepts we can express with sound to benefit sentient beings. The power of speech, such that anybody who hears anything we say, even our laugh, even saying good morning, it is of benefit to whoever hears us. This is the power of speech. We need this badly to benefit sentient beings. Full of this marvelous potential. Imagine this. This blissful red light filling us. And now Lama Tara very kindly sends from her heart chakra in the center of her chest radiant laser beams of blue light, blue like the sky, that enter our heart and instantly fill us and instantly annihilate, destroy all the delusions, the source of all the problems of our body and speech, the source of all our suffering and all the harm we've ever done to sentient beings. Starting with the ego grasping, the root delusion, this primordial ignorance about how things exist actually which then gives rise to this incredible aching suffering of attachment and dissatisfaction and neediness and expectation and possessiveness and always, you know, and uh, this emotional hunger in us that then gives rise to aversion and anger and rage and despair and, and, and annoyance and frustration and irritation and, de and depression and guilt, which then gives rise to all the other thousands of variations of these neurotic states of mind these misconceptions that our mind has made up over countless lifetimes. All of this eradicated. Because why? Because it's not at the core of our being. This stuff is adventitious. This is what Buddha has found. Because they're inaccurate cognitions. They're misconceptions. So they can be removed from our mind. <clears throat> they can be argued away. They can be destroyed. So imagine this, this blue light instantly destroying them. Not one atom left.
And now again, she so compassionately sends these rays of laser beams of blue light that enter our heart, and this time instantly filling us with what else but our virtues. What else? Right here, because if we rid the mind of ego grasping, all the other delusions, there is only space for whatever else is in our mind, which is naturally love, naturally compassion, naturally empathy, naturally kindness, naturally these qualities, which are at the core of our being. And naturally, bliss. The nature of mind, when it is unencumbered by delusions, is bliss, happy. This is the nature of our mind, full of this marvelous potential. It's blissful blue light. Now this time Lama Tara compassionately sends the three lights together, the white to the brow, red to the throat, and blue to the heart. And what this does now, we first now we've just achieved liberation, but we've got more to do. We need to achieve Buddhahood. So this removes even the subtlest imprints of all these delusions, even the subtlest imprints, and this including the development of infinite bodhicitta. So we become a Buddha, fully enlightened being. Imagine this, these three lights coming together, causing this. So now, we imagine the multicolored lotus that Lama Tara is sitting on just dissolves into light up into her body, and the lotus her right leg is, her right foot is resting on, dissolve into her body. And then you imagine she just comes very happily to sit above our crowns, facing the same way as us. Imagine this. And then she very happily dissolves into green light, having this delight, this wish to become oneness with our body, speech and mind. She dissolves into green light and merges. She uh, penetrates through, she enters through our crown. And then you imagine she completely fills us, the energy of the body, speech and mind of Tara, and the energy of the body, speech and mind of our own spiritual teacher and our body, speech and mind. They merge, becoming completely oneness, union oneness, as Lama Yeshi would say. Imagine this. And then imagine just expanding to fill the universe in the nature of bliss, no thoughts.
So now, out of our bliss, we, we, mani we think, you know, I've spent all these lifetimes becoming a Buddha solely for the benefit of others. So what choice do I have now but to, 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 to manifest so I can actually function to benefit sentient beings? That's been my purpose. So now we imagine in front of us <coughs> uh, all the sentient beings, the whole one way of dividing all sentient beings in the planet is into friends, enemies and strangers. There's no fourth category. Friends are the objects of our attachment whom we adore. Enemy is a label we mightn't use, but they're the ob that's, the ob that's the object of our aversion. Those who've harmed us. Those who don't do what we want. And then the third category, 99.999% of the universe, strangers. And who are they? Those who've neither harmed nor helped us. So how do we feel about the friends? We adore them. How do we feel about the enemies? We can't stand them. And how do we feel about the strangers? We couldn't care less. They could all drop dead. We don't care because they don't affect us. This is the view we have of the universe through the lens of the three, of the three toxic emotions. So now we're Buddha, you know, view is completely different. So we imagine, first of all, right in front of us, as if we're ordinary again, we imagine right in front of us enemies, people who've harmed us and we don't like, who've hurt us. Even those in the past we haven't forgiven, people we, you know, for whom we have aversion, right in front. Put them right there, eyeball to eyeball. But to the left, in front of us, our beloveds, the objects of our attachment. And now to the right and everywhere else, in front of us, above us, to the left, to the right, below us and behind us, filling the entirety of the space, all other sentient beings, all the strangers. And we think of all the beings of all the realms of existence, all in the form of humans, which is the form they can get enlightened in. The whole of the universe full of these sentient beings, friends, enemies and strangers. Imagine this. And now think, they are identical to each other from one point of view. Their wish to be happy and their wish not to suffer. Identical. So therefore, from my point of view, my wish to benefit them equally is equal because they're equal. No choice but to have infinite love for them, the wish they be happy, and infinite compassion for them, the wish they don't suffer. So now we imagine from our hearts, we send out, emanate out tiny, trillions and tiny green taras that, man, that enter, enter, first of all, into the, into, the, into the hearts of our enemies, those who cause us pain. Think of them. Take, and, these, and these taras enter into their hearts, taking away, first of all, all their suffering and the causes of their suffering, their delusions. Imagine this. We want them to be utterly free of suffering and its causes. Those Tara's entering into their hearts and right now be so happy that they're free of suffering and its causes, the delusions. Tara's entering into their hearts. And now the friends, same. And then all the strangers, imagining from all directions from your heart, entering into these trillions of sentient beings, taking away their suffering, and its causes, their delusions and their negative karma, every one of them. As we're visualizing these millions and trillions of Taras doing this, then we say a few times the mantra of Tara, which is the sound, the Sanskrit sounds that represent this energy of Tara, as we continue to visualize, removing all the suffering and the causes of suffering of all these sentient beings. 
Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha 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 Say quietly to get to ourselves. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha Imagining, continue to visualize all the suffering going. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha Om Tare Tu So now again we send Taras, trillions of tiny Taras from our heart, happily into the hearts of the friends, enemies, enemies, friends and strangers, this time giving them everything they need. Taking away their suffering, that's the practice of compassion. Giving them everything they need is the practice of love. May they be happy. So sending the Taras into their hearts, giving them everything they need, all the, all, the, all, the, all the things for their lives. And then finally, the happiness of their own enlightenment, the final ultimate happiness, of the, because of the removal of all delusions and the causes of suffering, and now the achievement of their own true nature, their own Tara nature. Giving this, imagine, from our hearts to all sentient beings. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha 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 Om Tare Tu Tare Tu and so on. And now this time, we now imagine, now that all these trillions of Taras, they've all turned into Tara, and now we, we visualize making offerings to all of them. So from all, again, from our heart, trillions and trillions of offerings, all the things to all the senses, offering all these marvelous offerings to ta all the Taras, and they experience the joy of receiving our offerings. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Svaha 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 And now imagine they all just dissolve into green light and all dissolve, all enter into us, each one of us, entering into us, enhancing even more brilliantly our entire nature. And then we dedicate our one hour of thoughts, we've, all these thoughts we've had. Thoughts about 
the Buddha, taking refuge, making offerings, thinking about depending on arising and emptiness, and imagining purifying all our delusions and becoming a Buddha, and then leading all sentient beings to enlightenment. All these seeds we planted. So maybe nourish these seeds from this second forward. So that when they when they finally we achieve our own Buddhahood as we visualized, we really will be able to benefit sentient beings. So imagine throughout the day though, so this thinking throughout the day, um, if we try and think like a bodhisattva, and bodhisattvas, not to mention Buddhas, that the only purpose they, the only purpose of their body and speech is for others. So we think, imagine our body, as we visualized, is for the benefit of whoever sees us, hears us, the creatures, the humans, the animals. That's why we're existing. Our body is for them. And our, and our speech, which we won't be having of until lunchtime, after lunch our speech will be for benefit of whoever hears us. And our mind, that's ours. So we're watching it like a hawk every second. Recognizing what is there, adjusting what is there, arguing with the delusions, increasing the virtues. That's it. That's it. So thus making every second of the day useful practice. Now we think of our breakfast as having not one atom of inherent existence. Not one atom. As Tsongkhapa says in his, in his prayer this morning, not one atom of existence, but nevertheless it functions exactly as we have established to give us health. And, 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 to, and to make our body healthy. So there's not one atom of existence on the one side, but nevertheless it still functions in the way we have established. It is tea and breakfast, but not without, without, without inherent existence. No contradiction. So realizing this, trying to imagine this, and then eating our breakfast with this thought of compassion, so we can be healthy, so we can be a benefit to others in the way we meditated. Jang chob sem chog rimpoche, ma kie panam ke guchi kie pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du hava shok. Make compassion, bodhicitta, grow and grow in the hearts of all.